You're listening to Someone Like Me, the official podcast of In Slavery, Tennessee. I'm Leslie, the host, and I'd like to welcome you to this very first episode of our second season. Our season one producer, Derry Smith, who founded In Slavery, Tennessee, has officially retired, so you won't be hearing her voice on the episodes in this season. But we welcome two new producers, Marissa Brunell and Stacy Elliott. Both are on staff at In Slavery, Tennessee, Marissa working with the youth that the organization serves, and Stacy working with volunteers and community groups. Just like you heard Derry's voice throughout the episodes last season, you're going to hear Stacy and Marissa's across these episodes, and you'll learn more about what they do in today's episode. So we've used the term trauma-informed care many times in this podcast, but we haven't ever done a deep dive into what it actually means. This isn't just a random phrase that gets thrown around. There are actually systems and principles by which trauma-informed care is utilized. So this first episode starts a brand new season by establishing a fundamental understanding of the term trauma-informed care. When we talk about serving survivors, Even if we're not working directly with them, it's important that we know why trauma-informed care is such an integral part of fighting against human trafficking. This line of thinking also informs how we plan this podcast, schedule interviews, and which guests we invite. This conversation also touches on volunteering within Slavery Tennessee. After the episode, you'll have some tangible ways to get involved in the fight against human trafficking. We also welcome two other In Slavery Tennessee staff members to the conversation. First is Kelsey, who's the Director of Direct Services, and then Caitlin, who runs Communications. As always, please be aware that our conversation has references to content that may be triggering or difficult for some. So please use your discretion while listening. Okay, on every episode this season, we are going to be doing Would You Rather questions at the beginning, just as an icebreaker for our guests. And we got this idea because when I would lead minor groups in the past, this was something that we would do to just kind of lighten the mood, get to know each other a little bit. And the girls always loved it. So sometimes they're serious and it really makes them think. Other times it's something just funny and silly. So that's why we're doing this today. So let's start with the questions. So would you rather have to start a new job every year until you retire or have only one job for your entire career? Caitlin. Oof. I think it would really have to depend on what that job is for my entire life. There are definitely some jobs that I would have stayed at, but others, no way. So I would probably say stay for the rest of my life. Most of my jobs have been better than not. So how about you, Kelsey? I feel like I have to say stay at the job (laughs) because of where I'm at. And if it's this job, then yes, I think staying would be ideal. But I love the idea of changing constantly. And so I think it would be kind of fun as long as they're not awful jobs to get to start a new job. Hmm. I'm an Enneagram five. So my worst fear is like not knowing things, not knowing what to do. So being the new person every year sounds Uh, awful. Gotcha. All right. I have one more. Would you rather never age or never need sleep to function? Never age. I love sleep. I love to nap. I don't want to not be able to sleep again. Same. Unless you can just pick to do it for fun. Like I want to sleep for fun and you don't necessarily need it, but you can still do it. I just really enjoy sleep, so I would not want to give that up. Me too. Love my naps when I get them. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. I think that's all. That's great. So the purpose of this conversation really is just to have a casual, laid-back discussion about trauma-informed care. This is going to be the first kickoff episode for season two of Someone Like Me. So in the room, we have Stacey Elliott, who is our producer, one of our producers, Marissa Brunell, who is another producer, and then Kelsey Mize, who is, tell us your title. I am the director of survivor care. Okay. And Marissa is? I am a care coordinator. Okay. And then Stacy, I am the community engagement coordinator. Yeah. So 
These are all staff members at End Slavery Tennessee, a few of which are on the production staff. And we are having a conversation today about trauma-informed care and how that affects not only the work that End Slavery Tennessee is doing, but this specific podcast and what that means for the episodes, what that means for how Marissa and Stacy formed this season. It plays a huge role. So Kelsey, trauma-informed care phrase that we use a lot. You're going to hear it a lot in this season of the podcast. Tell us what this means when it comes to the work that you're doing here. Yeah. So trauma-informed care at its core is switching our mindsets from asking what is wrong with this person to what has happened to this person. So it's a deep understanding of trauma, how that trauma affects somebody's life and decision-making skills, and then working to actively avoid re-traumatization of that person. So trauma-informed care acknowledges that the survivor is the expert of their own needs, of their own trauma, of their own experiences, and it's walking beside them on their healing journey instead of in front of them. The trauma-informed care approach revolves around the five principles, which are safety, trustworthiness and transparency, peer support, collaboration and mutuality, empowerment, voice and choice, and cultural, historic, and gender issues. Hmm. It's these principles that shape and guide the creation of the policies and the procedures, how we interact as staff, how we interact with the community, and it impacts kind of every aspect of our programming. So five principles. Would you be able to, for each principle, give an example of how that affects the work that in slavery is doing? Yeah. So it's kind of being an intentional in kind of every everything we do. So with safety, um, it's having cameras outside of our space to make sure that we can see who's coming and going and that the clients feel safe when they get there, making sure that they can buzz in and that the doors aren't just open. It's not just physically safe. So just rescuing a survivor from their trafficker, you know, and getting them to a safe place isn't enough. It's also creating that emotional and mental safety. Um, Mm -hmm. And so being safe people where they feel like they can come and express their emotions and their needs, and then they're not going to be judged or they're not going to be abused. They're not going to have their voice raised at them. There's nobody going to be aggressive, you know, that we can create that safety. Yeah. Marissa, how do you see that part, safety? affecting the way that you're working? Because you specifically work with youth. Mm -hmm. So what does that look like for your work? I think a lot of what Kelsey said, we incorporate, especially if they're going to be coming to our office, but also confidentiality, like maintaining what happened to them is, you know, that that's their story and not putting them in a position where that would be disclosed at all. Um, So we're very careful with their stories and who we are, like, I don't say, oh, I work with this youth and I'm from end slavery. Mm. I give the youth control and I say, who do you want me to be? So some of them are like, oh, you can be my aunt. You can be my mentor, Hmm. depending on where we go. You know, like if I pick them up from school or something, I'm I'm her aunt. That's fine because that's what she's comfortable with. So in that sense, that's like one way of creating safety. I think also just safety in conversations. So I'm never going to question their story I would never make them feel judged because sometimes, especially the youth, they don't have much of a filter, so they can disclose a lot and a lot of details. So they're never going to see like a shocked look on my face or a look of like horror or pity. Mm. You know, I Mm. think that's another part. Like I'm always careful with how I handle when people disclose their trauma I never want them to feel like I feel sorry for them. I am sad that they went through these events, but I think in part of maintaining that trauma-informed relationship is I'm on your team. I'm with you. I'll walk through this with you. I'm not I'm not here to feel sorry for you and baby you. I'm here mm-hmm. to help, you know, empower you to move forward. What's that second principle, Kelsey? That is trustworthiness and transparency. Okay. And so trying to be a person who, again, incorporating that safety, but being transparent with those clients and explaining what is going to happen throughout the program, Mm. kind of setting those expectations from the beginning of, hey, we're going to go to the office. This is what's going to happen when we go to the office. This is who I'm going to talk to. This is what it's going to look like. Um, We even, you know, printed out what the pictures of our safe house look like since we can't take somebody there prior to them entering services. So it's a way for them to kind of look through those books and say, okay, this is where I'm going. This is what to expect. So just trying to 
be very mindful about being as honest with the client as we can so that they feel like they can trust us and we can build that relationship. It seems like part of why that's so important is because as I've learned about dynamics between traffickers and victims is there's a sort of blurring of reality and manipulation that happens where maybe it's moving apartments often, you know, there's kind of this veil of confusion that's created. And so when you start working with these survivors, part of being transparent and honest is modeling for them what it looks like to be in a healthy environment, maybe? Absolutely. We are often some of the first safe people that they've encountered. And we can model what a healthy relationship looks like. A lot of them come from families who are not the most stable, and they haven't always had really great relationships or great people modeling what this looks like. And so getting to be that example for them of a safe person, of a trustworthy person. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing that takes uh, some time. Like, you know trauma-informed care, but they don't know what that is. And so building that trust, I think through expectations and saying, do they get to know what they can expect from you? And do you get to tell them what you can expect from them? And what does that look like? Yeah, I think as staff, we try to be really consistent. So across all of the case managers, if you go to one case manager, you should get the same reaction that if you go to the next case manager. To create that consistency of, I know what to expect. I know that if I go to this person and disclose this or talk to them about this, this is the things that will happen. We try to have guidelines and policies that they can take home with them. It's their handbook. And it kind of lays out their expectations of when they're in the program, what they can ask for or what ways they can go about getting their needs met or things that we have, you know, we might be expecting of them. And so it helps on that front and lay out so that they're not guessing or they're not wondering, okay, what's going to happen now or what's going to happen if I do this? That's a very empowering thing to give to these people because one of the big illusions that they often face in trafficking is, well, this, this was my choice to do this. So what I've heard a few times survivors say is that they thought it was their choice. But I think it's Becca Stevens at Thistle Farms who said, if that was their choice, what were their options? And so what an empowering thing to say, this is exactly what's going down here. And here are your options for real. And they're, these are healthy options for you. But it, it allows them to say no, I would think. Absolutely. And one of the the principles that we haven't got to yet is that empowerment. Mm. And so acknowledging that often these survivors have had their voice taken from them and had their choices taken from them. And so from the beginning, we try to reestablish that and give them choice and give them their voice back, even if it's small ways. We have a closet where they can go in and pick hygiene products and clothing and hair accessories and any basic things that they would need. And we used to just create a bag for them and hand it to them when they got there. And then we realized like even that little bit of having those times to go in there and to choose, I want this, I want this pink hairbrush as opposed mm. to the blue, just giving them power any chance we get because we realize that they've had so much taken from them. So this trauma-informed care is evolving because you're learning, right? That's one thing you learned. Is there Are there other things that you can think of that you've learned along the way? I can speak of the consistency part that we were just covering, actually. I think consistency of, you know, our policies, procedures, and what to expect is one thing. But I think also consistency just as a human engaging with them is very important. That's something that I've learned because they've been on a roller coaster usually most of their life through families and being trafficked in unhealthy relationships. I think being that consistent relationship, like Kelsey mentioned earlier, I remember one of the first youth that I had worked with would be like, you're always, you're, you're always rainbows and butterflies. Like I don't <laughs> trust it. And she'd huh. always look at me and like she was waiting for the other shoe to drop, waiting for me to mess up, waiting for me to be mad at her when she failed or, you know, when she tried to push me away and reject me, waiting for me to be like, fine, then go. And I think just staying very consistent with your clients no matter what, because we're all going to make a mistake. But being just that consistent and loving force that really sets that trust, establishes that relationship. So when they do choose to come back, they're going to come to you. Hmm. 
And I think going off of that and answering Stacy's question, something that I learned early on is, you know, at first when you start working, some of these clients can be kind of hostile towards you. You know, you're building this relationship and they might cuss you out at times. They might not always seem grateful or act pleasant. And something I learned that that was actually a sign of them beginning to trust me, that they felt comfortable enough and safe enough to express their emotions, no matter how mm. big that they were, and that I wasn't going to reject them even though they had that explosive energy inside of them. So that was, I think, something That's that profound. I've learned. This is a little bit of a spoiler alert if you're listening, but one of our episodes with a survivor this season, she's a foster parent or she was a foster parent, and she would talk about she wanted the most difficult kids, which are teenage girls. And what inevitably would happen is they would push back, push back, get more hostile, get more, more hostile. And she would say, I'm not leaving, but I don't throw kids away. And that starts to break down some walls, you know, when they, there's a trust that's built there, but it seems like it's, it's tested a bit. And that has to be a, there's probably a whole conversation in there about what our brains do when we're trying to gain people's trust and what that looks like. So what are the two principles that we haven't talked about yet? So one is peer support. Okay. So that's why we spend so much time fostering community among the survivors. So many of the survivors that we work with, they come in and they're like, I'm the only one who's experienced this, or I'm so alone in my feelings and, and feeling judged at places they go because they feel so isolated in what they've experienced. And so allowing for opportunities where survivors can come together and grow together, laugh together, learn together, and just really develop a family of people who have shared similar things. And, and while their stories might be vastly different, being able to say, I understand. Were there any other principles that we needed to talk about? So we have collaboration and mutuality. And so our program is pretty individualized. It's not a cookie cutter program. So when a client comes in, we really sit with them and allow them to express their needs, their wants out of the program, um, what they feel like their goals are. We don't try to impose our own opinions on, well, actually, you should be doing this, or actually, we think you should be moving in this direction. Mm -hmm. And so it's really understanding that, again, they are those experts and that they can come sit with us, and we're going to discuss this together and walk with them instead of trying to tell them what's best for them. Which is very empowering, again, just beginning to set that model of what choice looks like. Absolutely. And what decision-making looks like. Yeah, and that reminds me of, if you haven't had the opportunity to practice making good choices, you know, that may be kind of challenging. I wonder if some of your people that you work with might have a hard time making choices on their own. Do you ever get that pushback? Like, no, you, you, you do it. You tell me what to do. Absolutely. I think that we often see survivors kind of freeze and they, even little decisions, they can kind of become paralyzed by the options and by the choices. And so breaking things down to them and, and giving them smaller choices. Okay. You're not ready for that big of a decision yet. And so let's, let's move this slower or even helping them discover kind of what they want or what they like again. A lot of times they come in and they just, they don't know. And so it's, okay, well, let's go do these things to see what that might be that sparks joy or asking some of those like miracle questions of like, if your life was exactly what you wanted to be, if you had a million dollars, like what would that look like? What would you buy? And, and prompting them to kind of think bigger and, and maybe that can lead the way. There's a whole stage of life where we're asking our kids, what do you want to be when you grow up and start getting that conversation going that maybe they missed? That's definitely something. I mean, it looks a little different with the adults than with the minors, but down to, you know, what's your favorite color? And they're like, I have no idea. What do you like to do when you have the day off of school? I don't know. So I think part of my job anyways is working with them to develop that and figure out who they are. Because I think if you start to know who you are and like who you are and get that self-esteem going, that is going to help protect you from mm. being exploited again. Um, mm. So it's like this uncovering of who they are, which you can only do when once you've built that trust with them mm. anyways. Mm -hmm. Kelsey, I think there was one last principle that we needed to cover. Yes. So that one is historical, gender, and cultural issues. And so with that, it's just understanding that every survivor we serve is bringing with them some additional 
maybe baggage or different experiences that they might have. And so understanding that there might be preferences or they might want a female therapist or only want to work with a female doctor because of experiences that they've had or just understanding that because of the biases that they might have experienced, they might react in a certain way or accommodations that we may have to make based on certain things that they've experienced or certain things that have affected their culture or yeah. other issues. And I'm sure that's difficult since you haven't come from every culture for every survivor that comes across your path. It seems like it's more of a posture to just say, I don't know your experience and your culture, but when I know and when I start to learn, that's going to inform the way that we care for you. So it's again, it's a relational building trust to be able to learn, I, I would expect. Absolutely. And I think it's, again, being transparent with them of, hey, I might get this wrong at times. I might say something that is inappropriate mm. or I mm. might say something that's insensitive, but allowing them to teach you. And saying, I'm here to learn from you. You are the expert in your experiences and the things that have happened to you. And so how can I help? How can I be a student of you and your experiences and and really benefit from that? Yeah. I think in our job specifically, it's so important for our staff to really do that trauma work in their own lives because that does influence how we interact with the survivors. And so sometimes your own trauma can be triggered by something they say or something they do. And you have to put in the work on your end. So all my staff meets with a therapist that they have and and really doing a lot of that internal work so that we are able to better show up for our clients and not be triggered ourselves by something that they do or say. I have never worked for another organization that pays for you to have therapy. And that is such a huge gift that we get mm. as, as staff members and like how the organization recognizes the secondary trauma that happens in this job mm. and takes care of their staff. It's just amazing. Which is another reason why donating to organizations like this is so important. If you want to get into the work, and we're going to talk about this. Stacy is going to talk about volunteering, which is great. But so many people want to know how to get involved that that's why donating is so important, taking care of the staff members so that there's not burnout because this is a long relationship game. And so when you're taken care of in your job, you will be better equipped to do it well. That's true for all of us. And so I'm, I, that I am so encouraged to hear that. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought up volunteers. I started as a volunteer. I do happen to have a master's in social work, so I could do a little more than the average volunteer because I had the training and the background. But a lot of people come in uh, wanting to help and, and with great conviction in their hearts that this is something very important to them, and it is a very important issue to come together. But you can hear in this episode how complex the dynamic we deal with in helping survivors heal. Um, it takes a lot of training. And not just one-time training, it takes a continual effort and a long-term of building relationship. So when people want to work with survivors as volunteers, we have to just say no. <laughs> I mean, it's and these are the reasons why, because we want to give the volunteers the very best, but we also want to give our clientele the best. If you happen to be a therapist and want to volunteer, that's a training thing. And I sometimes liken it to people saying, I really feel like I want to help in the emergency room. Mm. I want to do surgery, you know, heart surgery. I want to help people live. And we say, that's great. But you have to go to medical school and you have to get yeah. all the right training. Mm -hmm. And you have to continue to get training and, and be part of that group. So I, I think our survivors deserve that level of care. And I think when you think about it, you understand if you don't have that training, you're not able to provide it even for yourself. Our our, mm -hmm. our own staff has to continually sort of manage their own self-care and making sure they have all the tools they need. So that's a hard truth for a lot of people to sure. swallow. Sure. Well, I think a lot of people want to be the ones to go into the sting and to go into, <laughs> You, I think you've talked about before is sometimes you hear that people want to go into the hotels and literally pull the girls and be like, there's a better way. You know, right. that's kind of the vision that a lot of people want to be on the ground doing the thing. And we're going to learn later in this season about 
law enforcement and stings and what's actually involved <laughs> and how it's not just walking into a situation. And I mean, that's highly dangerous. Yeah. And I know emotionally for myself, even, I think it would be so satisfying to like beat down a door <laughs> of a brothel and just walk in there and da da da. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's a lot about my own fantasy and mm. watching movies and thinking this feels great. I'm the hero. I mean, I think a lot of people want to be a hero and I think you can be, but I think it, the hero looks really, really different than the movies portray. And though it is emotionally satisfying to think in that way, to really be a hero, you have to really dig in deeper and think more, what is trafficking? How does the dynamic look? What skills do I bring to the table? Because that's what I'm looking for when people want to volunteer. I want to say, what do you have that we can use to help support what we're doing? And usually we can find something, maybe not right away, but I'm sure there are things we can do. And, you know, like Kelsey will say, hey, do we have so-and-so? Think about it, Kelsey. What do you need mm. regularly? Mm -hmm. Well, I think one of the most beneficial volunteer opportunities that we've had is hairstylist. And that's such a simple oh. thing and a lot of people don't think of. But when a client comes to our program, the first thing they want to do is chop off their hair. And so that can be such an easy way of donating your time or your resources. And if you are a skilled hairdresser, that is something we mm. can definitely use. Again, if you have those certain skills, if there are certain things that you can provide, therapist is always something that we can use. Leading groups, we love to have therapists, social workers, people who really understand this field, leading groups on trauma or just life skills. I mean, if you're uh. culinary, we have a lot of girls who've never learned how to cook. And so if you have skills in those kind of areas, dietitians, personal training, those are tangible skills that we can utilize to help with our support groups, to help with our survivors, um, lawyers. We are always mm. needing legal services. Yes, that's something clients ask for often is a lawyer, whether they have criminal charges or they were married to their trafficker and they need to get a divorce or they're fighting for custody yeah. of their child. I mean, our clients cannot afford lawyers. So mm. pro bono lawyer work is always welcome. Tattoo artists. I was going to say, and tattoo oh. removal. Yes, mm. cover-ups. A lot of our women come with, they're called brands, but it's maybe a tattoo of their trafficker's name, on, usually on their neck, face, arms. A lot of times they want that covered up. And so having a lot of willing tattoo artists who are willing to do that work for free is incredible and it's life-changing. Yeah. Yeah. Dentists. Dentist is medical, always yeah. medical. Other medical yes. helpers. Yeah. Yes. So many of those things were neglected while somebody is being trafficked. They don't go to doctor's appointments. They don't have those routine checkups. They don't um, take care of their teeth. A lot of addiction can impact that as well. And those are costly things. If you don't have insurance, yeah. those can be very costly. And so if you're not skilled in that, donating and being able to support that, that, that helps us greatly. So a lot of the things that you just talked about were directly working with survivors, but sometimes that's not ideal, right, for volunteers to be working directly with the people you're serving. Yes. I mean, our volunteers, they mean well, and we are so appreciative of, of what they want to bring to the table. But at times, you know, survivors might be asked triggering questions when they're with a volunteer. Volunteers may not be trained in trauma-informed care, so they don't know the right way to speak to them or maybe some subjects not to bring up. And so on occasion, we've had that happen where a well-meaning volunteer experience kind of re-traumatizes our survivor in a way. So I think that is one of the reasons we also choose not to have most volunteers work with our survivors, unless, like Stacy had said, they're like a trained therapist or social mm. worker. Well, and you even talked about earlier in this conversation not to pity the person. And I think I've heard you talk about before, Marissa, is there are some instances in which volunteers might hear a part of a survivor story and respond with oh my goodness, that must have been terrible or, or these sorts of things right. that, mm -hmm. that kind of come from that or place. I can't, of, uh, I can't imagine if that had happened to my daughter, how traumatized yeah. I would be or then tell their own story that definitely really negates what <laughs> the survivor mm. just shared also. So there's a lot of opportunity for faux pas to possibly happen in those types of situations. 
you know, that's that's not fair to the volunteer. And that's my that's mm. my main thing is I want this to be a satisfying experience for everyone when I think about matching volunteers in the right spaces. So we just want to cultivate good, solid relationships all throughout this organization. So that's kind of my philosophy on volunteering. Yeah. So we're just trying to set the best practices for these kind of things. And we make mistakes, too. One of our basic philosophies here is failing forward. Mm. <laughs> so mm. it's not like we're afraid to make mistakes. We're, they're just going to happen. And that's okay. About 12 years ago, I first started to become knowledgeable and passionate about this issue. And I really wanted to volunteer with survivors. I I love teens. I'm like, let me at those teenage survivors. I want to help them and save them. And I actually found an organization that let me. I was super excited about it. And I was paired up to mentor a 13-year-old who had been trafficked. And I only met with her a couple of times, but I can just speak from a volunteer standpoint. I was not equipped to deal with the things that she shared with me. I was a little traumatized after dropping her off at home. Like, wow, I'm leaving her at this place with this unsupportive family. I just wanted to take her home with me. I had bad dreams after that. I felt like I just wanted to save her. And I felt like there was nothing I could do and that the organization wasn't doing enough. And I wanted to just like email her things and text her things. And that was not what she needed. And I was not, I was not trained in trauma-informed care. I did not have the education that I have now. I hopefully did not traumatize her in our interactions together, but I can just speak from who I was back then. It definitely left an impact on me and greatly affected me in a way that I think it would it doesn't now. <laughs> so that's just my experience. And I wish that they would have actually said no because. For me, it wasn't the greatest thing for me. And I definitely was not equipped to save her or help her mm. at that point in time. Mm. And that's a really important story, Marissa. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and and I, I do want to emphasize there are things that we can do to, you know, if the studies, if you read studies about how you can really help organizations, I mean, it's money. It's the same thing. <laughs> that It always comes down to that. We can do more with the resources that we that we can do what we need at the time we need them. Some things that do help us, though, are gift cards. We talked about empowering survivors to make good choices and letting them make their own choices. So that's one way. I mean, that's a very powerful way. And even young people, we've had teenagers that have you know, Girl Scouts wanting to earn badges or earn their awards come work with us. And they actually come up with a program, a volunteer program that we're doing now. We're sitting in a room that's been decorated with Valentines, and they began this idea of, we want to decorate the space where the survivors get their care, but they didn't interact with survivors, but they made it fun. You know, Halloween candy and uh, decorations, and they did that last year on October, November, and December, different themes, and it was such a good idea that we keep doing that. So I'm constantly trying to find ways to engage that reflects who we are and allows the community to come in and do these kind of things that really do support us the way we need to be supported. And it's always about education first, always. The more you know, the better you're able to serve. And I think something that can be really difficult for volunteers and for staff as well is we might not always see the fruits of our labors. And so... The volunteering that they're doing now, the decorating of the space, the Girl Scouts weren't able to see the survivors when they walked in. And so you're not always able to see how your service affects or how your donation might affect the clients that we serve. And part of that is the confidentiality and the safety and all of those other things. And even as staff, we don't always see the effects. A client might leave services and we might not see them for years. And then they come back to us and they say, hey, Thank you. Thank you for giving me a place. Thank you for being, mm. you know, a safe place for me, for giving me those opportunities. And so knowing that your contribution, no matter how small you think it is, is affecting survivors. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. You know, one of the things I that just made me think, Valentina is an artist and she donated her services to paint a mural in our office. And whenever survivors come in, like they stop there. It has this beautiful quote and it's butterflies and colorful. They all want to take pictures in front of it. And she also donated a bunch of coloring books, which is a coping skill for most of our survivors. Hmm. So 
Valentina, if you're hearing this, thank you. It definitely makes a difference. Huge impact. Most of the things that our volunteers do makes a huge impact. They never get to see it, but we are so appreciative. So thank you. It's true. And it's hard. It's hard to be able, because of the confidentiality and because of all that, it's sometimes difficult to help volunteers and donors get a clear picture of what we do. That's why I say, for just like we build trust and relationship with survivors, that's not necessarily trauma-informed, but certainly a being informed of the dynamic what we're dealing with. You can become collaborators with us um, and ambassadors for this cause. That's what I think is the best way to consider yourself when you're thinking about volunteering in this complicated structure. Collaborate. Find out what the needs are. And if you can fulfill them, fantastic. If not, everybody can do some things. Follow on social media and and post. Getting the word out about what truth is is really important. You never know who you know that might be able to fill those needs. So if you can't do it, you might know somebody who, by posting, sees our ad and is able to help out. So let's talk about the story aspect then, because this is a large part of why we're even having this conversation is about this podcast, which was founded to tell survivor stories. But when you're looking at that from a trauma-informed approach, that kind of changes how it is you're finding survivors to tell their stories, what it is they're saying, what questions we're asking them, what the process looks like. So can you talk us through why every survivor may not be a great fit to tell their story on this podcast. Absolutely. So when we started this podcast, we put a lot of thought into creating policies around what does this look like for asking survivors to speak. We wanted to be really careful that we did ask survivors who were at a place in their recovery that was healthy and where this would be beneficial to them and not detrimental. So one of the components is that they have to have graduated from our program. And that is to add in some protection for them because we want while they're in our program for them to focus on their healing and focus on their recovery and really working through some of those traumas that they've dealt with. And so that's something that we request that they've either graduated our program or a similar program so that we know that they've worked through some of that initial trauma, some of their triggers. We want them to have talked with a therapist about what will this bring up if you're sharing your story. I mean, you're sharing some very vulnerable trauma. And so what is that going to bring up? What if somebody reacts poorly to your story? What if you read comments and they're negative or they're... Mm -hmm. Saying mm-hmm. things that are, you know, bring you shame. How are you going to react to that? What are you expecting? What are your expectations in that? We want to make sure that when we're asking survivors to tell their stories, that their motivation is not to please us or not because they believe that they owe us. The survivors, if we ask them to share their stories, a lot of them are going to say yes because they want to make us happy and they don't they don't want to disappoint us. And so we have to be very careful to make sure that their motivations are right and that they're doing it for themselves and not for us. We also want to make sure that they understand that they might be triggered through this. And do they have a support system that's healthy for when they leave, their nightmares might start reoccurring or certain things might come up that they're not expecting. And so we really try to put in place where we have a case manager in the room in case they're triggered in the moment, but also that case manager will meet with them afterwards, follow up with them, make sure we're doing some aftercare with them to ensure that they are kind of surrounded and supported throughout that whole process. And then we let them listen to the podcast afterwards. Mm-hmm. And if there's something that made them uncomfortable or if they did not feel like they said something, it, they don't want that to be shared, then they can always get that edited out afterwards. And so I think We've been really mindful with the podcast process Mm -hmm. to really ensure confidentiality, ensure safety, and to make sure that they feel empowered in those moments. And we've had episodes that we've recorded, we've edited, the survivor listened to the episode and didn't want it to air. And so that's part of the production process where we set that as a priority. And if they don't want it to air, that's it. And one of the things that we do tell them as well is... Only the people who are in that room will hear what you said. And if you approve it from that point on, then we will send it to the next person who is editing it, who's applying, you know, mastering and all of that. But again, transparency to let them know this is exactly the process that we are going to follow and we're going to follow through on it. And sometimes they decide that they don't want it to move forward. And that's really important. 
We also have a conversation beforehand. This season, it's me. So we'll talk about what do they want to talk about. We don't tell them, hey, this is the topic you're speaking on. We put it out there and let them come up with what do you want to emphasize? And they may or may not say, I want to talk about my trafficking. It might not even be anything about that. So we let them call the shots. And then we also let them read the questions ahead of time that we're going to be asking during the podcast so they can say yay or nay, so they can prepare themselves for that if they want to. And then like Kelsey said, they get to do the final edit. So I love that we give them that much, that much control. And sometimes it's not even a question answer scenario. We had a survivor interview where she brought in a prepared written document, which is wonderful. You know, she gets to make that decision to say, this is how I would like for my story to be told. And we did have some follow-up conversations after that. But I loved that we were able to provide this space for her to tell her story in the way she saw fit. And part of this was when Derry Smith was working on the beginnings of this podcast. I mean, there are survivors who have come into this room to share and who, while we're getting set up, said, yeah, I spoke at this thing last week. And they started asking me these questions that get sensationalized. People want to hear details. And so people listening to this podcast may have this expectation that, oh, I'm not that they want to hear nasty details about people's trafficking stories, but For some reason, society wants sensationalized information. That's just what we've become attuned to. And so we want to be very clear that exploitation can occur in those situations where I've seen situations where survivors seem to be asked to tell their stories in a way that seems like what it's doing is a better thing for the person who is asking the story to be told than the survivor themselves. Absolutely. I was just talking to Kelsey before this, and I've worked for an organization in the past in another state where the young woman, they felt obligated to speak. Mm -hmm. And they would go up and speak in front of all white audiences, very wealthy. It's completely not their demographic at all. So they're already feeling a little bit like an outsider. And then to get up on a stage and share your story that's super intimate and be asked those questions and feel like you don't have the choice to say no, I would see the aftermath of that. And some would relapse or they would have nightmares. They'd cry afterwards. They'd feel re-victimized. They'd feel embarrassed because people would pull them aside afterwards and want to know more details and ask questions. So that's very much the opposite of what we're doing here, yeah. <laughs> which I'm really, I'm really proud of our organization and how careful we are with their stories. And that is why we're going to incorporate less survivor stories this season, but also we're going to incorporate their voices in different ways throughout the episodes. Yeah, because it's really important that you understand through this podcast what it is to be someone like me. And so we're going to highlight some of the professionals who are working directly with survivors so that they can understand what it's like to work with trauma-informed care. And when you were talking a little bit about how we do this podcast. A lot of podcasts are entertainment and they are sensational and they do keep people's attention. And that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. But that's not why we're doing this. And when it comes to people's personal intimate stories, I hope that trauma-informed care can become more of a standard in our culture. It's just more respectful. And I think it's kind of what we need in our culture too right now is to honor people for what they want to bring to the table and not try to put something on them that's not what they want out of the experience. Mm. We don't need ratings. Hmm. That's not that's not our goal here. We need to keep doing what we do well. Mm-hmm. Kelsey, there was something you said that I want to end on, which was that the trafficking part of their story is not all of their story. And that's something that we when we sit down to interview survivors, if that's the format of the survivor voice, or if, you know, later in the season, we'll have some different ways, like Marissa said, of of bringing in the survivor voice. But the questions that we're forming for these people really want to focus on what's next and the enjoyment and the delight 
of what comes next for you. What are you excited about? Because that's the beautiful thing about what In Slavery Tennessee is doing. It's not just the, I'm going to put this in air quotes, rescue. It's not just the plucking out of a bad situation. It's the rehabilitation to thriving that is really the work that is being done here. And it's difficult, messy work. And so I'm just grateful that we get to tell those stories with that filter. I think every day when I tell people what I do, they always look at me and say, oh my gosh, that's so sad. You have the, you know, such a hard job. And it's like, no, I have such a beautiful job. I get to do the fun stuff. (laughs) So I get to take a survivor to the zoo for the very first time (laughs) and watch her face light up as she sees the animals. Or I get to celebrate a birthday with a survivor who's never gotten to celebrate a birthday in her life or see her reunite with her children. And that's something that's been years and years in the making. And so getting to be with them through some of these milestones that we have taken for granted all of our life. That's the beauty and that's the excitement and that's the stuff that I love to share about what we do. Often I don't tell people what I do or they ask and I just say I work with youth that have been abused. Like I just try to make it very generic because I hate the accolades, first of all, because that's not what we're here for. I feel honored to get to work with these survivors. We're very honored that they even allow us into their lives to be a little bit of a part of their journey and to just love on them and encourage them and call them forward into the future that they hope to have. So I think all of our staff feels that way. It's very humbling to work here. It makes you just appreciate a lot of the little things in life. And I think every day that we get to work in this community, I think it's just a a greater blessing for us than I think most people would imagine. It's definitely not sad every day. Hmm. I think there's way more joy than sadness in this job. Yeah, You know, you don't want to sugarcoat it completely because it's not all rainbows and butterflies. I think what you said before, there are some hard, hard things, but it is the joy. And like my daughter would probably say, my 13-year-old daughter would say, uh, yeah, it's low-key awesome. <laughs> kind of it's it. kind of like that you know it's yeah. it's slow simple stuff and I don't know if you heard a minute ago but when Kelsey said something about first time some of them ever celebrated their birthday our engineer just audibly gasped mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because it is the simple joys that we get to be a part of and it is so humbling but it takes a certain attitude to be able to do it well with survivors and that is We stay humble. Mm. That's not hard to do. Talking about staying humble, I'm going to puff you up real quick. But there's a beautiful story about a piano that one of our survivors told last season where she, she grew up loving music and while she was trafficked, that was like stolen from her. And she had an interesting story where she was groomed like in her 30s. And her trafficking story was much later in life than a lot of people who have grown up in that environment. But can you tell us the story of the piano as an ending note? Sure. Well, I had been invited to do a support group in the safe house. Um, I'm a social worker, and so I had the skill set. I resisted working with survivors initially because I knew it would cost a lot emotionally Mm. for me. But the person on staff who invited me to do it said, we need it. And uh, we'd like for you to do it, please. And I said, oh, (laughs) that's why I'm here. I wanted to do whatever you said. So, okay, I'm doing it. And um, that's where I met this wonderful woman. And, you know, I saw right away that she had this gift. And it just so happened in the church I was going to, there was another woman who was trying to work with her life and get rid of things that she didn't need or use. And we just happened to cross paths, I think, it just happened across paths. There was mm. design in that. And she said, I had this piano, <laughs> this, and I just, I don't need it anymore. I'm, you know where I could, I'm like, oh, yeah, I kind of have a situation. <laughs> and so I remember bringing it. I remember setting it in the office, and she was going to come in and see it. And I, it was a big deal. But in a way, it was kind of a small thing, mm-hmm. you know, but it, it, was, it allowed her to reacquaint herself with this real gift that she had. And I think it was part of her healing. Mm-hmm. I think it still is, actually. Yeah. It speaks to joy. It speaks to hope, which is ultimately why you all do what you do. So thank you so much for this. This is great. Every-
Every inch of end slavery's work is motivated by trauma-informed care, and hopefully you've been able to see how that's true in this conversation. It's more obvious when it comes to working directly with survivors, but it even affects the way marketing and communications are done. So we sat down with Caitlin Reed, who runs communication and marketing for In Slavery Tennessee, and asked how trauma-informed care influences her work. So we have Caitlin in the room with us right now, and the context of this conversation is to talk about trauma-informed care and what it means for In Slavery Tennessee, especially when it relates to staff members. And so, Caitlin, tell us what it is that you do for In Slavery and how you interact with all the things that are going on. Well, my official title is communications and event specialist. So I am over all of our outgoing communications, like social media, newsletter, website, et cetera, as well as all of our fundraising events that we have throughout the year. Okay. You know, we're, we're talking to Kelsey, who's direct service, working directly with survivors. That's not necessarily something you're doing, but trauma-informed care permeates what it is that you're doing. Correct. So... I am really in charge of anything that's public facing. So interweaving the trauma-informed care and language throughout all of the messaging that goes out for in slavery is really important because not only are we trying to change the way that people think about human trafficking and the language that they associate with it, but also to be very inclusive and considerate of all the survivors that we serve. If they are to see any of the messaging that we put out, we want it to mirror exactly what we are telling them and offering them within our services. Mm -hmm. And I would think, too, one of the things that I've heard survivors say is they don't often see themselves in the way trafficking was portrayed. So it they didn't think they were involved in trafficking because the way that things are shown as being trafficking was not their experience. And so I would imagine some of what you're doing as well is modeling what does it look like for trafficking victims to become survivors and what do they really look like and what does it mean? Right. Representation really matters through all things, but especially in identifying potential clients or victims. We want to make sure that we're diverse in the photos that we show online, which we don't show photos of any women or clients that are in our programs, but make sure that we are representing different genders, ethnicities, races, et cetera, and also changing the way of thinking that every victim of human trafficking is literally bound or chained mm -hmm. and imprisoned. And that's, as we know, not what happens. It's a lot of manipulation and that doesn't involve being physically trapped. Yeah. It's those images that are punitive and, and also they're just irrelevant. And so people get the idea that that's what it's supposed to be like. And so that's what they may be looking for. And it's just not true. It doesn't help anybody to have those images up there. But that's what when people think of human trafficking, they often do think of that very thing. So you redid the website just recently, Caitlin, and you really made it feel like I think it feels in the office. It feels kind of homey. It feels positive and with light. And it really, it really is beautiful. So if you haven't checked out the website, you really need to see it because yes, it's really nice. To. It's beautiful. But I think it really also reflects our character here at Enslavery. Mm -hmm. Well, and you even mentioned imagery, finding the right stock photos, for example, because you don't use images of actual survivors to protect their privacy. So you're using stock photography at that point. And so you have to be very intentional with the stock photography that you're choosing so that it's representative of people you might serve, people you see on a daily basis, people in Slavery Tennessee is helping. Have you ever had feedback from the direct service team uh, that helped you craft something new? Absolutely. Only being here for a year at this point, I didn't have any trauma-informed care training before I came to In Slavery Tennessee. I did, however, in previous jobs work with at-risk populations, but this is a little bit different, especially the language that we use. And a lot of the interaction I've had with direct service in terms of our social media and things that we put out there is 
being very conscious of the language that we use, you know, trying to stay away from the word rescue and just being really strategic about how we how we word posts that go out, newsletters, things like that. I work really closely with Catherine Barkley, who's our development specialist, and she crafts a lot of the language, the survivor stories that we send out, direct appeals, things like that, et cetera. We want to be very, very, very conscious of the language that we're using because not only is it a reflection of our organization, but again, we're trying to change the narrative and the types of language that gets used surrounding trafficking. And the event specialist part. So if you're listening to this, hopefully you have tuned into our launch on March 12th, which happened pretty soon before this episode you're listening to now. But then also last season, you were behind the scenes, the one pulling all of the triggers and things for the live stream broadcast, which involves lots of very complicated things that unless you've done before, you may not know quite is what's involved. You're doing that, though, for other things that in slavery is a part of, right? So there's things like trafficking at home, right? Is that these are sort of the programs that you're facilitating? Yeah. So we have a training webinar series called Human Trafficking at Home, where this year we're going to talk about the four pillars of our approach. Last year, we kicked off the series talking about conspiracy theories and responsible journalism. And this year, we're going to really hone in on what is in Slavery Tennessee and the approach that we take to our programming here. Uh, but I do run, I'm essentially the man behind the curtain uh, with all of those uh, live streams. She does such a fabulous job. So making sure that graphics are good, um, everybody is able to log in and use their camera and <laughs> getting us connected to all of our social media so that we can do live streams. But it's a facilitation, too, of questions that come in because when we're doing these sorts of things, we ask for questions because it's interactive and it's a really great chance to ask experts. I mean, some of the stuff you've been doing with other TASA agencies, with these experts in, in their field, if you care about this subject, you have a really great chance to learn some things. And so part of what you're doing is you're fielding those questions from people and presenting them to the people who are on screen. So that's having trauma-informed, you know, sensibilities and, and learning what that means, you can know what sorts of questions are going to be incredibly helpful for other people to know. Right. Yeah, there are definitely, during some of the live streams we've done, questions that are more helpful to the audience than others. So with having this trauma-informed background, it definitely has made it easier to know which questions are going to prompt good conversation and good responses from any of the panelists that we've had on the live streams. And others are just not as helpful. So it, it does help definitely making sure that our content stays on mission, on brand, and to be as helpful and informative as possible. Yeah, I'm really happy that Caitlin came in to talk today because it really illustrates how important trauma-informed care is, not just for the people working directly with survivors, but also for every person who is engaging this organization. We mm -hmm. want everyone to be informed and very much aware of what trauma-informed care is from our board members to our volunteers and just beyond. We love the whole community to be trauma-informed, as a matter of fact. In one of our webinars that we did, Human Trafficking at Home, Tracy, who is a therapist there, Tracy Busey, she has done a lot of our training for trauma-informed care, and she says, if the whole world acted with trauma-informed care in mind, what a world it would be. It would be a beautiful yeah. world. Mm -hmm. That's great. After each podcast, we want to allow you to have an opportunity to engage more with the topic that we've discussed. And today, we are offering to let you delve a little bit more personally into trauma-informed care. We did a human trafficking at home webinar not long ago, and we provided some tools online. So if you go to our website, endslaverytn.org, you can find these tools under Human Trafficking at Home, Trauma-Informed Care. There's a link there, right, Caitlin? Because you did that. Yes. Yeah, so all of our previous Human Trafficking at Home webinars live on our site. And then for this specific episode, we developed a packet that you can use to follow along with the training episode, as well as some exercises of how you can apply trauma-informed care to your life. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Thank you to Kelsey and Caitlin for joining us on this first episode of the second season of Someone Like Me. We want to thank Jones Legacy Group for their continued support of this podcast. We are so grateful. Our production staff is Gregory Byerline, Stacey Elliott, and Marissa Brunell. Claire Bidigary Curtis is our engineer. The original music you hear is by Zach and Maggie White. I'm Leslie Eiler Thompson. Thank you for listening. <laughs>